Um, well, let's begin with, with prayer. Gracious God, we are gathered here this morning on this beautiful day that you have given to us, um, along with all the other gifts that we receive from you on a daily basis. Uh, we ask that you open our hearts um, to your word, to your message, to each of us, that you enter our hearts and you take root. Uh, and, and that at the conclusion of looking at your word, talking about your word, applying it to our lives, that we will emerge with what it is that you intend for each of us to do with our precious lives, those lives that you have given each of us that are in service to you. So. We pray for all of those who are not with us and any, any in our congregation and, and friends that um, are in need of your comfort um, and especially um, your healing. Um, we ask that you be with Gwen this Monday as she goes under um, surgery for her knee. Um, we ask that you be with her, you lift her up, hold her in your hand and help with the healing um, so that she can resume her, her life as you would intend. Um, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to look at a, a parable that I'm sure everybody's saying, I know this parable, and you know this parable, you do. But um, sometimes I think it, uh, I guess I've been avoiding it because I thought everybody knew it. But I think it is good at times to go back over things you think you know, if nothing more than to um, see if God is revealing something else, something different. Um, something deeper in, in his meaning. And I suspect that will be true for each of us. So um, it is in, the parable is in uh, Mar Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, I'm picking Matthew um, to read from because it is the, the most um, comprehensive in terms of including some of the references from the Old Testament that, that Matthew is, is um, commonly does in his gospel. So, um, it's in chapter 13 of, of Matthew. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large, large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn an eye would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. 
When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Well, this is one of the few parables that Jesus actually explained himself. Explains, and I suppose he, um, we can all speculate, but I imagine he explains it because he wants to make sure that they don't get lost in the farm analogy and understand what message he is trying to, um, to, to give them. Um, we talked a little bit about when we began this study of the parables about why Jesus started using the parable as a means of, of teaching. And um, there's lots of, uh, you know, Jesus says what he says um, about it himself. Uh, and I think the most fascinating part of, of what he is trying to say makes you kind of think, does he not want some people to understand? I mean, is he trying to be, um, is he trying to conceal his truth from some people? Um, and that is not at all um, his intent or his desire However, it is clear from this parable and, 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 and the rest of the parables um, in the Bible that, that um, while Jesus is, is going to talk to anybody he can talk to and answer questions from anybody you know, that asks, um, he's going to tell the truth, but the truth is going to be received or it's going to be rejected. That's what's going to happen. And that's not just to him that happens, you know, to, to, um, anyone, um, yeah. what along that same line, wouldn't the Pharisees, uh, all through, you know, the story, we have the Pharisees, uh, asking questions, trying to trip him up and catching, you know, uh, so I guess it's, it's, it's the person receiving the message, uh, how they want to receive it. Is, is that a, a good example of, Somebody that would be listening to a parable and not understanding it would be. A well, that's it, basically what the parable is saying. Yeah, is that people are gonna are gonna listen with different kinds of hearts, mm -hmm. and that's and that will literally affect the success of um, the message that Jesus is giving. How they receive it with the different kinds of hearts, a absolutely. And, and one of the reasons, one of the frustrations that Jesus himself had was the Pharisees. Consider that before Jesus entered the picture, before he was born, I mean, you know, before he was born, all, well, the majority of the people at this point listening to Jesus are Jews. I don't know if Sid can hear us or not, but the screen froze, but. Uh... Mine did? Yes. Go back about two sentences. Can you hear me now? Yes, huh? Oh, all y'all are moving around and so am I. So I didn't, how would I tell that? Can you hear me now? Sure can. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what was I saying? Oh, before, um, before Jesus came on the scene, who were these same people listening to? Where did they get all of their religious instruction and all of their guidance? They got it from the, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the scribes, they got it from their organized, if, and I don't mean that negatively, their organized religion, you know, on Sabbath, in a synagogue, in the temple if they were lucky, but in, in synagogue. So the people, they had been listening to the Pharisees and the scribes. Now Jesus comes and Jesus is saying one thing and the people that they had been listening to all this time aren't embracing what he's saying they aren't you know they aren't rushing to hear him following him around um and that is a real um that's a real issue for jesus and i'm sure he was if you can 
if you can permit me to say, I'm sure he was disappointed in the fact that they were not receiving his word. And that made it very difficult for his disciples who were Jews and had been following them as well as others in the area. And so um, uh, Jesus was probably a little frustrated at the nipping at <laughs> nipping at the edge of his robe, if I can use that expression, that the Pharisees seemed to be doing. I mean, they were just kind of messing with him all the time. In fact, right before this parable, they're messing with him about something, you know, to do with the Sabbath. And then they're, then they're saying to him, hey, you know, why don't you do a sign or a miracle for us? And I, I'm sure Jesus had moments where he felt like this isn't a show. This is an entertainment. Um, and, and what I want from you is, is your commitment from your heart. Not, I don't want to, I don't want to entertain you and just, um, be some source of, of amusement. Um, and I'm sure that was frustrating for him. And, and at this point, he switches over to these parables and many commentators who have, and there's so, there are tons of books about parables that are fascinating, um, Many of the many of the um, theologians and and commentary writers that have looked at the parables, they say the parables are, are a very interesting um, form of teaching because in effect, what Jesus does with these parables is when he tells them, they reveal um, truth to those who are accepting and appreciating it, and they conceal the truth from those who would resent and abuse it because of the state of the mind of the people who are hearing it. So interestingly enough, a parable can reveal the truth or conceal the truth. If you're receptive, you get the truth. If you're not receptive, you don't get it. You, you, you don't get it. So they kind of reveal and conceal at the same time, which is fascinating um, from an intellectual standpoint, if you want to think about that that a story, because they seem to be stories, um, can both reveal and conceal at the same time. It, and Jesus um, it, it says in this very parable, you know, if you're listening, if you're hearing, if you're using your ears, you're going to get it. You're, you're, you're going to um, understand. Um, what what I'm what I'm trying to say to you. Um, so it, so at this point, I think Jesus we see is maybe a little bit over it. And after clashing with the Pharisees, and he and he leaves and he walks away. He go, at the same day, he goes over and um, walk, you know just leaves the city, so to speak, and goes out um, to sit by the lake. A bunch of people follow him, and um, this was also not uncommon to teach in this um, kind of an, an atmosphere, because if you want to think of the hillside as sort of like bleachers um, and Jesus at the bottom goes out into the lake, maybe they figured out the acoustics on a lake are pretty good. You know, you can hear sound speaking across it, or perhaps you just get further out in the boat and more people can see you and you can see them. You know, either way, he goes out in, in the boat and he begins to speak to them. There are some commentary writers who think maybe right at that moment in the distance Jesus sees a farmer sowing some seeds who knows I mean he sees them and he thinks he kind of sees the analogy sowing seeds teaching you know his followers um, maybe that's why he came up with it um, at that point but clearly all the agricultural um, based parables are because the whole economy was about growing, growing something. And everyone there not only could, but would understand um, using that type of analogy. So he tells a story about a, um, a person sowing seed over different types of um, soils. And as he finishes it, he says, whoever has ears, let him hear. Well, probably the disciples are thinking, well, just about everybody there had ears. So what does that mean? You know, everybody probably did. So what's, you know, so what's going on? And that's when they begin to ask him why he teaches in parables and also, you know, what's it all, what's it all about? Um, I think 
Um, sometimes I think some of the translations in the Bible, when when the words, the let me let me start again. If someone says something is a mystery or a secret to you right now, I think you have a different connotation or feeling about that as when Jesus says the secrets or mysteries, you know, um, it's not, sometimes we think of magic or, or things that Jesus doesn't intend. When Jesus talks about the secrets of the kingdom or the mysteries of the kingdom, um, he's actually trying to, uh, well, he's, he is, he's trying to reveal um, some of the, um, and I'm going to use the word secret, but don't think of it that way, of the Old Testament that were obscure or perhaps even hidden under the old law. Some things about the kingdom, some facts and truths about the kingdom that were obscured or hidden, in a sense, in the Old Testament, Jesus is going to start to reveal them, reveal them. And he's going to reveal them, a lot of them, in his parables. Because that's what Jesus is here to do. He's here to reveal. He's here to reveal all about God, all about the kingdom of heaven. And so he's going to be in the business of revealing, taking the lid off of things, taking the cover off of things. And then at his crucifixion, the curtain is torn away. I mean, you, you kind of see the analogy. Jesus is here to reveal everything he can about, about God. Not make it a secret, not keep it hidden, but to reveal things. And he's going to start doing those kind of things through his, his parables. <clears throat> Starting with his disciples, the people he selected, and, you know, kind of moving out to more and more people. I mean, that's that's the idea. Right now, he's talking, as he describes, explains it, he's talking to his disciples when he explains the parable. So let's just talk a little bit about the, the elements of the parable before, just to make sure we're all on the same, at the same place. The, um, the sower, I mean, we talked about what, things mean or represent or symbolize before. So let's just get the sower, the seed, and the soil. Let's get on common ground here. The sower is not one person. All right, so it's not Jesus only. It's not God only. It's not the Holy Spirit only. It is a very generic idea of anyone anyone who is teaching proclaiming revealing sharing the seed which is god's word so parents uh, personal testimony sunday school teachers certainly god jesus and the holy spirit preachers all of them are sowers everybody's a sower in this parable Everybody in, who is proclaiming the good news in one matter and another, including your individual testimony, um, you're a sower. And the seed, as I said, is the good news of the kingdom, the word of God. So let's just stop right here and make, let's get again on common ground. This parable is not about the skill of the sower. And it's not about the quality of the seed. Those are given. Those are given. It's, it's not about how good a teacher you are, how good a preacher you are, how great your personal testimony is. It's not about that. That's a given that it's good. The word of God is a given that it's good and true. It's not about those two things. It's all well said. It's happened again. Oh, okay. I don't see anything. That's okay. You just froze up again. How am I going to know that's happening? I'm talking <laughs> to you pretty soon after it starts. Okay. All right. What about now? Hey, we're fine. Okay. I think it has something in the program. Maybe it's the way it breaks or something. But, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Did you get about it's all about the soil? Did you hear that? Nope. 
Because that's important. Okay, that's the important part. Forget about the sower and forget, I mean, forget about the um, seed. Think about the soil, the various kinds of human hearts that hear the word, hear the word, and how they receive the word and react to the word. So um, the sower's good all the time, the word's good all the time, and the success is all based on the condition of the soil, the hearts of the receiver. So um, how do we hear the word? I mean, and I, and let me say this, I, I, I've been, I've been working on this for several days now. And every time I start in, I think of something else. And so I'm going to say to you, here's was my latest thought this morning, right before I dialed in. I don't think you're necessarily in one of these groups and stay in one of these groups forever. I think you can move in and out of these groups. That's just me. I mean, as I was thinking about it, I went, you know, at certain parts in your life, you could be in some of these groups um, and come back out again. Uh, so just think about that and think about how you how you view it or or whether you think everybody's in one group from the beginning and they stay in that group, you know, from the beginning. So we're going to start with the um, roadside or the wayside or the hard dirt, however you want to um, describe it. And this is the soil that's typically around the perimeters of the field because people use it as a footpath, you know, around the fields instead of walking through the grass. And if any of you have a path in your, um, I think if we've got one church in, in your yard that people use instead of the sidewalk, after a while, no grass will grow on it. Nothing grows on it. It's hard, almost as hard as rock. Um, and that's what we're talking about. And, and here, it's not that um, there may not be a deliberate sowing of the seed there in the sense, but um, I know that I have, when I've thrown grass in my own yard, I've thrown it into the flower beds and then had to go back and get it. So you throw it out and it goes a little over the edges you intended to. So that's the seed that's fallen on these, on these paths. And this soil represents people with closed hearts, um, hard hearts, perhaps. Um, and, and they're probably, they're hard for a couple of reasons, likely. And one of them is, they are um, just so dense because they are just in love with their lives and in love with the things that they do. Um, I won't say in love with sin, but some people might you know, include that. And the truth can't get in, can't get past um, the hardened of their hearts. And um, so they're spiritually dead in a sense of spiritually dead. We see a lot of that in the Old Testament I mean, um, in, in the King Az Zedekiah in Second Chronicles is described as he became stiff-necked. I always like that expression, stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Stephen, the martyr Stephen in the, in the New Testament in Acts, when he describes the people that are persecuting him as he is being um, accused of blasphemy, he says to them, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you have betrayed and murdered the righteous one. You have received the law through angels, but have not obeyed it. Again, these are closed hearts. Um, the Pharisees could perhaps be in this category um, in this sense. If they think they already know it all, they already know it all. You can't tell me anything. I already am the expert in the law. I know it all. There's nothing left for me to learn. Um, that could be the case. That could be the case of some people, but it could be the case of some of the Pharisees. We, we know it all. Who are you? These hearts, those hearts aren't prepared in any sense to receive um, the good news or be receptive to Christ's message. Um, the seed hits this hard ground. And as they describe in the parable, birds come and pick it up which is true by the way the birds but the birds will pick up the seed in the good in the good field too but they pick it's easy to pick it up on these hard grounds snatch it up and in effect it's like the devil just you know they symbolize the devil snatching the message before it can 
take root. Um, this, is a, this is a concept of the seed is on the ground, but never in it. It's just on top surface. It's just sitting on the surface, but it never gets beyond the surface. And then you go to the next ground, um, shallow ground, a shallow heart, a shallow hearer. And this, um, this is a situation where, and I just had this happen to me with clay. So, you know, there you got about eight to 10 inches of good, good dirt. This is the farmer sees dirt, good soil, and probably about eight or 10 inches. And then about 10 inches down, it's rock or clay, <laughs> which is, acts just like rock sometimes. And it's invisible to the person sowing. The seeds are thrown. They come up quickly, come up quickly, but then the roots hit that rock. They hit that level about 10 inches down. And the sun comes out, sucks up all the moisture out of the um, soil, and the plants wither, fade, and they die. And these are people who hear the word and they are um, emotional about hearing the word. They respond quickly in many cases. I mean, they are just, just completely consumed by it, but only superficially. Um, they show interest. They show joy at receiving the word. I mean, they're, they're all over it. And then life comes along. And there's not a person on this call, I'm sure on this Zoom, that hasn't had their faith tested in some fashion in their life. Life comes along. And it could be loss of a job, it could be a broken heart, it could be sickness, it could be death, divorce, um, something that just shatters, it's shattering. I mean, and that is a fact. No one's gonna like, take that away. But when it hits these shallow hearers, their faith isn't strong enough to withstand um, the test. And so um, they turn away. They just turn away at the first test of their faith. So, and it's really not a question of, of uh, if they will, it's really a question of when, because the seed got on the ground, got it into the ground, but it wasn't able to take root down far enough so that it could withstand all the trials and tribulations that come. And I would say that Jesus himself told us, it's not easy to be a Christian, it's not easy. And in various places throughout the New Testament, he makes it very clear what the cost of following him is, what the cost of discipleship is. And it's not insignificant nor small, but then neither are the rewards um, for being a, a believer. So these people start out with a bang and then the first test and they kind of just fold because it didn't the, the the message the seed did not get a chance to take good root now the next group is an interesting um, group it's thorny ground it's also been called the worldly he hearers or the or the strangled or choked heart um i'm i'm, I'm guilty of being one that that does exactly what I'm going to describe. You get out there and you, maybe you want to do a garden or maybe you're just digging up your shrubs and beds and you're going to plant something new. That's hard work. And after a while, you get, you get less and less dedicated to getting out every single rock and every single root that's there and the weeds. I mean, you know, you can do, you can work forever trying to get it all out of the soil. So, Maybe you don't. So you leave a few weeds, you leave a few roots hanging around along with the, the, the uh, soil. So you've plowed it, but you haven't done it completely. And so you sow the seed and the seeds get um, choked by the weeds. Now that's the literal. The figurative is the heart, you sow the seed and the heart gets choked by life, by other things that 
are fascinating to you or other things that you are in, are very much concerned about or involved in riches material things pleasures all of that the worldly here all of this is going on all around you and you are you are um heavily preoccupied by these worldly matters and so in effect those worldly matters suck up all of the nutrients and the water and the seed, the good news doesn't have a chance either to take hold. Um, these are the people that maybe are best described when Jesus talks about serving two masters, serving two masters. Um, and, and he says God and money in some of the translations that you can't, you can't serve two masters. You can't love money and love God. You have to choose. These are the people that choose not wisely. They choose the money and Christ gets crowded out of these hearts. So the seed goes in, it goes on the ground, in the ground, down in the ground, and even gets some roots, but it never comes up and grows and thrives. It never comes back up through the soil and grows and thrives. Now at this point, when I was doing it, I thought, oh my gosh, that's three groups and we are not bearing any fruit in any of those three groups. That's kind of discouraging. Three groups and nothing. No fruit, no harvest, no nothing. Well, then we get to the last one, and that's the fruitful hearer or the one with an open heart. That's the great soil where the seed goes in. Um, and it just, you know, goes into the dirt. It goes down into the dirt, um, and it takes hold, and it comes back up and grows and thrives and flourishes. And these are the people with the open hearts, the noble hearts, the good hearts that are receptive to the message. Matthew describes them as listeners who um, hear the word and understand it. Mark describes them as listeners who hear the word, accept the word, make it their own, and then make it a part of the way they live their lives. And Luke describes these good listeners as people who hold the word fast kind of becomes a part of their DNA and they follow it no matter what. Not just when it's convenient, but they follow it good times, bad times, not just when it works for them. So it's ingrained in them. That's this group. And so this group is the group that bears the hundredfold, thirtyfold, sixtyfold harvest fruit that Jesus um talks about in his parable so one way to look at the parable is to say you got to figure out where your heart is you got to figure out whether your heart is open or closed or in some manner in between you have to um prepare your heart so that you not only just hear it but you understand it and accept it and make it a part of your life so that you're always searching that word for deeper and a deeper and more significant meaning um, to the point that no matter what, that's where you go first to this word in order to live your life and endure life in good and bad times. And your perseverance in this case, allows your lives to be more and more fruitful. The more you hang in there, the more fruitful you become. And, um, and the fruit, by the way, uh, most of the um, commentators think the fruit is, is more in the fruits of the spirit that we're very um, familiar with. The, um, the love and joy and peace and gentleness and faithfulness and long suffering and kindness and goodness, those kinds of things. Interesting, um, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah says that the Lord says, break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. He's telling them then. 
Get your hearts ready to hear my word. You need to be getting your hearts ready to receive my word. Now, many of you are probably familiar with William Barclay as a a commentator, and he has a, he calls it, a more modern interpretation of this of this um, parable. And his his interpretation of um, of what Jesus is saying is, think about who he's talking to. He starts out, he goes, think about who Jesus is talking to. He's talking about his to his disciples. And his disciples are observing what is going on around Jesus. They observe how the Pharisees treat him. They observe how some people treat Jesus as in rejecting or receiving, and even in some cases, resenting and abusing. And they're becoming disillusioned. And they're becoming um, discouraged about all this hostility. Their dear teacher, whom they have left their families for, that they would follow to the ends of the earth, is not being treated very well. People are hostile and people are um, doubting him. So the question that they might have in their minds is, is all of this teaching going to nothing? Nothing? I mean, four groups and three of them bear no fruit at all in that story. Are they thinking all of your great efforts are going to produce such a small little result? So perhaps Jesus, as part of this parable, is telling them as the next sowers after him and there'll be more and more sowers sowers remember is a generic group but at this point you know it's more it's it's the group is getting larger he selected them to be the sowers when he leaves and as well as others followers perhaps he's trying to tell them that no matter how much seed goes wasted right no matter how much seed goes wasted those first three groups. In the end, there is a great harvest. In the end, for sure, there is a great harvest. And and to some extent, the farmers of the time um, would agree with this. They throw out a lot of seed. Every time they throw out a lot of seed and they know all of it's never gonna grow, never. But in the end, they get a harvest. They get a good harvest. So maybe the lesson to the disciples is Never be discouraged when nothing seems to be happening right away. Don't be discouraged because everything you say doesn't create plants all around you and people just flock you. Um, But you have to plant the seed. You have to keep sowing the seed all the time. And don't worry about um, if any of it is necessarily um, appears to be wasted um i'm here's a story that i did not hear in the context of religion but heard it in um in a in training when in, as it relates to if you're trying to tell people something you want them to believe or buy into or or um accept a truth a truth this is the story that i've heard In 1640, 1640, a young man named John Harvard came to the United States, came to America from England. Very young, very bright, wonderful future ahead, and he lived one year, one year. He died a year after he reached America. And when he died, he left 700 pounds, that money, and a collection of 200 books. I'd say that's probably a lot of books for somebody to own in 1640. Left 700, 200 books to this new university in America. That university is now Harvard University. So the point of the story was 700 pounds, 200 books. He just left what he had to this school. And now thousands of wonderful professors teach 10,000 plus students there all the time. Just keep throwing the seeds. You just don't know what's going to happen with the seed eventually. And also to be considered in, in that is 
be prepared to take a risk. Be prepared to take a risk. Farmers take a risk every time they plant. They don't have any idea what's going to happen. None whatsoever. Every time they put the seed out, it's probably a crapshoot in the sense, am I going to get anything or not? Be prepared to take a risk. In Ecclesiastes, it tells us, he who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. In other words, if you, spend, if you think, all right, I'm, I, it's too much wind, I'm not going to put any seed out today. Still too much wind, I'm not going to put out any seed. Oh, wait a minute. Too, it's going to rain, I'm not going to go sow. And, hey, you can do that forever and get nowhere. So in other words, if you do nothing, what do you get? Nothing. If you do nothing, you get nothing. So you have to jump out there, not wait for the perfect time, the perfect setting, the perfect weather, the perfect temperature. If you do that, you'll never get started. You'll never get anywhere. You just need to take that leap. Pardon this, but take a leap of faith, literally. Take the leap. Just start with what you have. Risk everything for what you believe in. And there will be a great reward. And that kind of applies to any truth, not just necessarily God's truth. It could be justice. It could be if you if you believe something is right, then you just got to risk everything and take the leap and keep sowing the seeds. Um, me personally, at the end, I got a little concerned about how many how many of these different things have I been in in the course of my life? That's where I got there. How many, how, where have I been throughout the course of my life in terms of these different kinds of soil? And I thought, wow, how do we get ourselves in and out? How do we get ourselves prepared? Um, and I, I may have said this to you all before, um, but I personally, this is my personal belief. Um, I believe God created every single person and creature on this earth in his image. Every one of them. That's, so I start there. God created them in his image. And he has been trying his hardest from the beginning of the fall away due to our own free will to get everybody back into a relationship with him which is what he wanted to begin with. He wanted everybody to be in a relationship with him. He created us to be in a relationship with him. So he's not happy, if you can use that term. He's not happy that there's a lot of people in these other categories at all. And I don't believe for a minute that he sits idly by, just waiting, you know, hoping, you know, crossing his fingers that everybody's going to open up their hearts. I personally believe that there's pinging that goes on all the time. We are God's creatures, and he is pinging us all the time. Um, the people that it bothers me about are those that don't know that God exists. Those are the ones that I struggle with. That's, I mean, those are the disciples of the world that really go out and that work. But you know what? That may not be as many as we think, because most people know that there is something called a God. Most people, you know, in, at least in the developed countries, you know, of the world. Um, I think God is pinging all the time. I think his Holy Spirit is out there working all the time, working for those who do believe through them all the time, because he knows we can't do it by ourselves. We are fallen. We are imperfect. We are sinful. Um, and we need his help to get there. We need his help to get there. And his help has been throughout the ages. It's been his prophets. It's been the, the judges. You know, it's been the kings. And it was Jesus have been his help in getting us all there. And now it's the, it was the 12 disciples. And now it's the next group and the next group and the next group of disciples to try and help us all get to the fourth group, the op you know, the open hearts, because we, we do need help. I mean, honestly, sometimes we do close ourselves off. Sometimes we do. 
Sometimes we get in dark places, even people that know him. So think about people who's, who are, who are faith isn't, isn't strong. Um, I think that we are here and we are saved then to serve and to keep sowing God's seed. That we are the present day sowers and we just got to keep serving him by sowing the seed. And the sowing of the seed isn't necessarily you got to be a preacher, a Sunday school teacher. You just have to be a model. You just have to be a model by the way you live your life. That might be the best of all sowers because you're going to reach far more you reach far more people than you realize um, because they're not sitting in church they're not sitting in church on sundays but you by the way you live your life reach many more people and uh i think we are indeed um all intended to be sowers of god's seed by by our personal lives by our personal testimony by the way we treat people and by the way we, we live our lives um and I think we can probably look at these four categories and think about people we know. Think about people we know and where, and where their heart is, where their heart is. Um, I'm not hopeless at all, I think it's, but I think it's a very realistic parable about got to throw out a lot of seed and you got to keep throwing out a lot of seed and you can't give up and you can't. You can't expect to see immediate results and you just can't concentrate on the harvest. You just got to keep concentrate on the seed throwing. You just got to keep throwing out the seed and, and live in your life so that you can help others, um, others come to Christ. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples in the end of the day. Boy, don't concentrate on, on it. Just keep persevering just keep on telling god's truth so i'll stop and ask for your comments or your thoughts or whatever well you know <clears throat> throwing out the seeds and we may never ever see the results yep we may be gone before we ever see any of what okay. we hope for Right, and we like instant gratification, so that's hard. We, you know, we, we want you to come as soon as we say. So and that is hard, but I, I agree with you. We may never see it. It could be generations. You know, as you talked about uh, the parables and explaining why the parables, it kind of related to something that I did in my counseling. When, when we have to tell somebody something very difficult that they're not going to want to hear or they don't understand i tried to start with a soft beginning sometimes just as simple as saying i'm going to say something to you that's very hard just a soft beginning and although it's not a parable in its sense uh, it's getting ready to speak to somebody whose heart is not prepared to hear what you you're going to say yeah the truth to speak the truth yeah when the, because the truth is often hard it's often it's often harder so, yeah anybody else do you think you can move in and out of those groups in a lifetime well i think we do all the time all the time <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we could stay in the fourth group forever? <laughs> I think some of it has to do with hard truth too, you know. Yeah, <laughs> Sometimes. But, yeah. yeah I can. Or, or, or at times in your life, you know. Times yeah. in your life. Yeah. I think I think it depends on how you interpret the parable. You know, I think if we if we interpret it in the sense of of our daily lives, yes, we might go in and out. But if you look at it in a broad sense in in interpreting it as who is in salvation um i think once you're in that you're in that third group you're in there you know i think there's probably a couple of ways to look oh, yeah. at that um and that that opens up some other questions about 
who's saved and who isn't, but but I think it, it can apply to both concepts. Well, I would agree with you. I, I didn't want, I don't want to imply that I think you get saved and unsaved. Right. That's, yeah, that's not where I was going. No, I heard all. you right. Yeah, absolutely, if you're saved. But I think, you know, you're receptive. You're more or less receptive at times in your life for the whole truth. You know, because it is not easy. It is. It, it's not easy because you are, in many times, going against um, some norms when you're a Christian and you uphold Christian values. You are at times um, the odd man out, so to speak. Probably most of the time. Yeah. So it's hard, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, it, so sometimes when people, you know, I mean, you can make that case for Peter denying Christ. I mean, you know. And you, you, you know, at the same time, you, when it happens, you just go, oh, my goodness. And then you say, I get it. You know, he's sitting there amongst all those people. Everybody's wound up shouting horrible things. And you're going to say, I'm with him. You know, those, it just, you know, it's, it's, it is hard. So, yes, I agree. I agree with you that it's not about being saved and unsaved in the course of your life. But it is more or less how receptive to you are to God's truth all you know along the way I also i also think it's a part of growing when we feel like we've been off the path and then get back on it's a time we grow like maturing we never stop growing no i don't think you ever stop maturing as a christian and if you think you have this probably you should probably take a little step and say <laughs> am i become one of those that knows it all now in this sense I don't know that we can. I doubt very seriously that in this lifetime, we're going to get it all. We're not going to get it all. We just can't. We're just not capable. That's where your faith comes from. I know from. that you said that the group you worry about the most is those, you know, who maybe haven't heard. Right? You said that. Yeah, people, yeah somebody needs However, to give to them. I don't think, you know, we do need to continue however we can you know, uh, spread the word, but I, you know, God is going to let everyone hear before everybody's going to hear before everybody's going to hear the word before. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, you know, I hear what you, yeah, I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why God bless the disciples of the world that go into these places that are yeah, in sure. effect cut off, you know, from, um, the mainstream that are absolutely. in pockets. Yeah. Honestly, they're probably very receptive. They're probably very receptive to the hope of the message. Um, yeah. And you you mentioned um, sowing the seed that we all that, that uh, in a lot of different ways people are sowers in a multitude of ways. And and I I think um, I think an interesting point is. That, uh, we, we often think about sowing the seed as preaching or, or spreading the word, the Bible. But I wonder, in another sense, if, if the, and you mentioned that we might be an example in the way we live, I wonder if really a powerful way to spread the seed, so to speak, is just living in a loving manner and showing love. Mm -hmm. and what a powerful seed that is. No, absolutely. I, I agree with you. The way you treat people, it, you know, I mean, just in everyday encounters. So in a sense, we're constantly throwing seed. Yeah. By our lives. Yeah. <laughs> even when, you know, even when we're not thinking about it, we, we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. And it could be good, you know, it could be a good, a good experience or, you know, a, a bad one. But, you know, we have much more influence, I think, than we realize on people. Anybody else? Hey, I really appreciate you guys listening. I just want you to know that. We appreciate you. I really do. I appreciate it. <laughs> we appreciate your preparation and your message. Well, um, if I were if I were honest, and I am honest, so I'm honest. <laughs> I get so much out of it. This is so selfish on my part. I get so much out of it. And I think to myself, 
what would I be doing if I wasn't doing this? And I don't think I like what the answer might be. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be, de you know, developing um, and maturing the way I am. So it is absolutely, I mean, I, I might do it even if no one was listening kind of thing, because I've enjoyed every minute of it. I mean, um, I've got so many books on the floor behind me. Every time I turn around, I want to learn about something else, something else, something else. It's just, it's infectious in the, in the most positive way for me, for me. Um, so anyway, I, so I, I appreciate you all listening. <laughs> well, we thank you. Too. Well, thank you. Yeah, we thank you. Well, it's my, it is indeed my, it is my pleasure to do it. So. Well, if no one has anything else, then I'll, I'll say a, a prayer um, and dismiss us. Um, let us bow our heads. Gracious Father, I know we all feel your presence with us this day, that your comforting, loving presence as you enter into our hearts and open them wider and wider to better understand how it is that you want us to live, um, live as your children, um, live as your sowers, um, just live, live as loving neighbors as you've asked us to do. Um, we, we strive, we try very hard to, to, to do as you would have us do. And we ask you to just help keep our hearts open and our ears open to your message to the Holy Spirit that we feel so deeply inside each of us. Um, as we leave here this morning, please help us indeed be a blessing to each other and to every single person that we encounter for we know that they are your creation and that they are your child. Um, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.